Oh, right. God. That was amazing. That was adorable. Um, guys, thank you so much for being here. Very excited to talk about all things love with you today. I want to start with this. Um, there are so many couples on television that I grew up loving. Uh, pretty much it really started for me. I think there was a show, there's so many young people in here, but it was called Sisters and it was with Celia Ward. Yeah. Yes, so Teddy and Falcon, man. Like Falconer and Teddy were just where my soul started when the car exploded, spoiler alert, I still am haunted by it to this day. So I would love to go down the line, Liz, I'll start with you. Who is sort of like the first television couple you remember having strong feelings about? Um, Bo and Carly, Days of Our Lives. <laughs> My friend Jenny knows it. She was Jack and Jennifer. I was, I was Bo and Carly, and um, I had very strong feelings to the point where in high school, I thought that to have sex, you needed to buy like a one piece kind of slip corset to go under your clothes. Like I thought when you're a lady, that's what you wear. You you wear a one piece corset thing under your doctor's uniform. Uh, so when Bo Brady like ravages you in the break room, you're like ready to go in the doctor's sleep room. Jenny, what about you? I think I'm trying to think. I have very, sh I feel like I block out most of <laughs> Things that happened before, like five years ago. But um, uh, I th I'm pretty sure my first one was uh, Brenda and Dylan. I think that was a big. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, 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 Night that. swimming. I am so old. Um, the first, I, I was very worried and very invested in Frank Ferrillo on um, Hill Street Blues, a show probably no, and, and I, now I've forgotten the name of the DA that he was in <laughs> love with. Uh, captain Frank, you know, a, a, a cop captain and, and a DA. Yeah. And the tension was sexual and political and, and they sat bolt upright. You learned what you learned. I learned that the precursor to sex was to sit bolt upright in bed. <laughs> and have a conversation without looking at each other. <laughs> I'm the opposite. Mine was uh, Buffy and Angel. When they had sex and his soul left and then she had to kill him. <laughs> it is still so upsetting. <laughs> it is still so upsetting to this day. Um, Yes, that's right. You know, there's a lot of elements that go into building a relationship on screen, and there's a lot of ways we can go about doing that. And Hart, I want to start with you. Uh, I struggle to think of a show that has slow played a relationship more than Bones. I mean, you didn't even get these people together until many, many seasons into the run of the Season show. Six. I mean, when you created Bones, did you envision that this was going to be part of its DNA in the way it is now? Um, yes and no. Uh, I, when we were casting the show, um, I, can't, I can't tell you how different uh, David Boreanaz and Emily Deschanel from, are from each other as human beings. And, but they have this, on screen, they have this remarkable sexual chemistry. Off screen, they are so sibling-like that it's a little creepy to watch them uh, uh, go back and forth. Um, so m we cast them for that sexual chemistry, but I was willing to see if we were going to do a show in which the male and female lead did not ever hook up. Mm -hmm. um, th that you could do a thing where ma a man and a woman could work together, be very intimate, and not have a sexual not relationship. Not possible. Well. <laughs> Everyone I work with. Quickly enough. <laughs> Quick, quickly enough, we found out that you could not waste this yeah. um, sexual chemistry. But we also found out that we could, we were gonna, we were gonna put it off until people were screaming, which is is what we did. I mean, what have you found, sort of? And you know, I'll start with you on this. Har. I mean, what have you found is sort of the amount of time you can drag something like that out until people really get heated about it? Six seasons. <laughs> Now, it, it, people were getting heated in season five. And that's six were, network seasons. Yeah, I mean, that's like yeah. 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 It's 100, long. Yeah, that's so. 110 episodes or something. Um, um, you, you throw every obstacle that an audience will believe between them, mm -hmm. and eventually you're going, we can't. And it, we, 
so fortunate. Um, we knew, okay, we're going to have to get them together. We can't put this off anymore. And then Emily came and whispered in my ear, uh, I'm pregnant. And I went, I know what to do. <laughs> because I think the part of a relationship that is really boring and makes me want to kill people is when they are happy. And they are, they are brand new and they're in love and you know, uh, running through fields and walking in the rain and on the beach. I just kill them. So uh, we managed to avoid that by having her instantly be pregnant. So they had another thing to mm -hmm. keep up that relationship. I mean, what do you guys think about the amount of time a couple can be happy on a television show before something ruins it? I mean, how long is too long? Can you actually write a relationship that just endures and is not fraught with problems and the problems exist outside that? I mean, Friday Night Lights did it. You know, they made it clear, I think, in, in speaking about that show that Coach and Tammy were going to always be fine. Nobody was going to have an affair. Their marriage wasn't going to be in crisis. They were a happily married couple that certainly went through trials and tribulations like any other married couple. Um, and they had things to overcome, but that their marriage was going to stay intact. So I think you 100% can do it. Um, I think it's challenging, uh, but, you know... It's possible. I mean, I think about it though, you know, Dawson's Creek, I remember 13 seasons, you know, the first 13 episodes, it was like Dawson and Joey are like kissing in the window and we come back for season two and we're like, well, oops. <laughs> 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 like, you know, and it became eventually, you know, the Joey and Pacey show in a lot of ways. And that was the couple that you really invested in because who you thought you were gonna invest in got together so quickly. So I think it depends. I mean, Friday Night Lights was unique in that you were coming into a solid marriage, and I think you wanted to see that remain solid. Mm -hmm. You know, Dawson's, I'm just using these two examples, um, was, uh, you know, it was a, you know, girl down the creek who no one noticed, you know, pining for the boy, you know, across the creek that, um, you know, was James Vanderbeek. So um, uh, that was a different setup. Yeah. I, I think it's also, you know, I think Bones is, had, had a nice uh, procedural element that could distract you from, mm -hmm. from that. And when shows are built around romance, it's much harder to, uh, to sort of string things along because that's why people are tuning in. So you do get kind of in this. Let's have them keep dating other people. And it's like, if you put another person in there, right. I'm going to kill you. you know? Well, I was going to ask, you know, obviously faking it was about a lot of things, but at its core was a show about romance in this relationship. I mean, what surprised you about exactly what you're talking about, sort of building a show on a relationship and then sort of having to push and pull and make that malleable to make the series endure? Uh, I think the hardest thing is to keep the journey fresh. Um, and to keep it from, you know, have we had this push pull in past episodes? How do we, how do we throw up an obstacle that feels real to the characters and not just like stalling? And, you know, it's 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 a tricky balance. I'm sure some fans would say we didn't do it that great, and other fans would say we did it amazing. You know, I think. Um, Con the funny thing to me is fans often want the thing that's going to be the most boring. Right. You know, they're like, right. just put them together right now and let them be happy and run through the weeds. And it's like, well, that's <laughs> not fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then what do our episodes look like to you once we've done that? It's fair. <laughs> I understand. Um, but, I you know, I'd love to talk a little bit more about that because I think uh, you and Liz have written a lot about sort of the discovery of love and sort of those early burgeoning love experiences. <laughs> Uh, Carter, what excites you as a writer about putting that experience on screen? I think that um, I, I think that those little moments, like the time your hands brush, or the like, the time you uh, were stressed about something and they showed up on your doorstep with flowers, like just those little moments um, are are our fantasy. I mean, they're really our fantasy. And it's like reconnecting with, I've been married now, I'm with my husband for 10 years, but I still miss the rush of first love. You know, I think everybody remembers that first time that endorphin flow hit them and the, that moment that they, you know, all they can think about is this other person. And, you know, uh, so it's fun to relive it in a TV show instead of with an affair. <laughs> Wise choice. Wise choice. <laughs> what about for you, Liz? I mean, it's interesting. It's like, you know, as, as you write, I think 
in a weird way, I've, I've noticed this is kind of a sideways answer, but like the the love stories that I've been inclined to write about lately, I mean, it probably started with Life Unexpected, which in some ways Life Unexpected, it was so much about, you know, these these two parents who, I mean, I don't know if anyone knows the premise, but it was like two parents who gave, got pregnant in high school, didn't like each other, gave up their kid to be adopted, and the, and the kid, Britt Robertson, never got adopted, and then through a TV contrivance gets put back in their custody. So it was a lot about this love story between Kate and Baze, these two main characters. Um, but it was, and that was so fun to write. But at some point, it kind of became, and I know this isn't love and romance in like any kind of sexual way, obviously, but it became more like a love story between this group as a family. Mm. And I think what I've noticed in my own writing is how the idea, of in, in a way, love and romance, again, not sex, but love and romance has fanned out to include other things. And I've just noticed as I've kind of chosen shows or been fortunate enough to get on shows lately, you know, Bates Motel. That is a love story between Norman and Norma. It is disturbing, but that is a love story. That is a romantic story. It's not sexual, mostly, um, but <laughs> it certainly has romantic elements. Um, casual, the relationship between Valerie and Alex, that is a love story. It's not a sexual story. It's not incest, but it is a love story. And these, these two people are soulmates. They happen to be brother and sister. And and so I think it's been interesting um, how, I don't know, I've gravitated, I, I'm so into love and romance, but I've definitely gravitated in expanding out what that means and also looking sub in a subversive way at it and, a, and in your question of being sustainable, looking at relationships that really can't be. Norman and Norma can never get together, rom you know, <laughs> truly <laughs> romantic. They can never be each other's person in the way that like we kind of all aspire to have that. That's the perfect obstacle to build a series on. Same with Alex and Valerie. Um, so there's something really fun about writing that because you're always trying to think of obstacles. And I think I've just happened to gravitate toward really big obstacles. I mean, I was just watching a panel with Sarah Shapiro. And obviously, I'm a big fan of that show because of Shiri. And um, the relationship between Rachel and Quinn, that is a love story. Um, and I think that it's it's fun to explore kind of non-sexual love and romance, too. Absolutely. I mean, Jenny, I would argue that the relationship between the V and Wave of women on your show is one of the best romance love stories on television story. right now. It, it's our biggest love story, yeah. always, and always has been. And we say it over and over. That's where the wish fulfillment is, mm -hmm. that, you know, your family is always there, that, you know, you're going to fight, but you're there. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. Coach uh, Tammy and, you know, like, they're not going to break up. They're going to have fights. Right. but. And, and that's always been the central romance. And whenever people go and team Jane, or team Michael, team Raphael, I'm like, just team Jane, just want her to be happy, you yeah. know? Um, and, and we've really centered the show around that relationship. And, and not that we don't have all these big romantic tropes and we play into them, and, but a lot of the show has been um, deconstructing Jane's idea of what romance is mm -hmm. and what a fairy tale ending is and what it should look like. And I think, um, that as she became a mother and started to realize, it, she's realized that the family is really, you know, as long as she has that, she's okay. And I like yeah. putting that into the world. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I mean, that said, there is one of the classic romance elements in your show. Oh, yes. Of the love triangle, which we are, <laughs> could rattle them all off all day. <laughs> um, we could just talk about like a whole panel about Buffy, Spike, and Angel, I feel <laughs> like. I just think that. But we won't because we like each other now, and we should keep it that way. Um, but I mean, you know, what I think has been really interesting about what Jane has done with the love triangle element is that. I can't really remember a time when everyone could agree that everyone in the love triangle is a good person, and it's just at times one is better than the other. There's always an element of like, well, he's the worst, or she's mm -hmm. terrible. And like for me, Michael Jane and Raphael are all great people who kind of all deserve each other, and you're like, maybe I'm just like a thruple. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we would do on casual. <laughs> I mean, Get them you, all together. <laughs> let's just do it. I mean, can you talk a little bit about sort of writing a love triangle where there's no antagonist in that sort of traditional sense? I mean, that was our goal, was to, you know, speed. I was just thinking back six seasons without getting to them together. After I wrote on a show that was canceled, I thought, oh, God, I, I waited till episode 13 for them to get together. It's not going to happen again. we got to move. <laughs> so, um, like, you know, uh, we, we did that early on in, in Jane, and... I really wanted people to invest in Raphael and in Jane, thinking that the fantasy of, of this this couldn't just happen with no with 
for no reason. I'm, I'm accidentally artificially inseminated, and this is my uh, guy I had a crush on, like, meant to be. What does that mean? <laughs> um, and then, you know, after that happened, we wanted the the you know the pedals to fall off and 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 to literally yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> and 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 also to um, remind her of what she had with Michael before so we had to rely a lot on flashbacks and stuff to rem remind people without taking away from Raphael how can we build up this other choice mm -hmm. um, and that was a lot of the challenges that it, at any moment if I felt that the room was tilting too far one way I would kind of double down on the other without making someone cheat right. or someone lie or someone, you know. Um, so it, that was the struggle, was, was to how, how can we make a balanced love triangle? And I think the answer is that half the people will stop watching when she <laughs> chooses one person. But, um, but you know, the, uh, I think it makes it more complicated and more interesting. And also, I couldn't have Jane fall in love with a real asshole. Because right. what does that say about her? Right. You know, and you want her, her to be a person who you trust and who you want to go along the journey with. And if she's after somebody who's a jerk, then she loses her credibility. Yeah. Um, so that was that. That's a big part of the calculus. I, I mean, that is an interesting thing you bring up because if you're writing love interests for your leads, you, you also have to think about what that person says about your main character in the long run. I mean, what are some difficulties or things you've discovered about writing through doing that? Well, we we went through this. Uh, uh, I had to tell every actor who came in to play a love interest of either of our leads, I'm so sorry what you're about to go through <laughs> on um, uh, media, on social media. You're going to be attacked as a human being and, <laughs> because the Bones fans are very, very passionate. Um, and we were very careful to do the best we could to do the exact same thing, which is the, the women that Booth um, fell for, there were two. One was a stranger we hadn't met before in the show, and the other one became a, a regular, someone from the past. Both of them were vilified when they first got there, and then after a while they were loved. Brennan, we had a slightly easier time because she's so um, um, illogical and rational that she could fall for a guy who looked good on paper. Mm -hmm important that he looked good on paper to the um, audience as well. One of the tricks we did was um, there's an actor who looks a lot like <laughs> David Boreanaz. Um, uh, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie McClintock. Eddie McClintock. He's a dead ringer. I was like, did you Dead like ringer. Like yes. Um, <laughs> yes, we did. We thought, because then someone could point, uh, for one thing, also Eddie McClintock, he's his own guy. He right. radiates goodness. He's a sweetheart. Yeah. And Booth, David Boreanaz does not radiate sweetheart. He radiates <laughs> lots of other things. So, um, uh, and so the I'll say he does. We, <laughs> uh, we did do that on purpose. That everyone in the show, aside from her, would say, "You've got Booth, easy Booth, easy nice mm -hmm. Booth," um, and and that worked very well for us. But um, and then um, uh, poor Catherine Winnick, who now plays a Viking warrior <laughs> on Vikings, uh, was on, and I swear she got the toughness to be a Viking warrior by being on Bones and being uh, uh, Booth's uh, love interest. Because oh my God. <laughs> Uh, she was the character who he actually proposed to her, and she said, no. And the fans, oh, my God. how dare you say no? And, I, and then you want to say, what would you have done if I'd said, and he said, yes, and they got married on the show. Right. That would have been over. But, um, you know, you cause these problems, so you have to uh, cure them. But, yeah. but th thank you for noticing that. Oh, I, I, I thought I was so I was like, wait. That's not good <laughs> that, you, that you thought that. We failed in some way. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. But it does bring up, I, I think, casting in romance plot lines is so important. And one thing we did on Faking It was we had a chemistry read for anyone who was coming in. Um, to, to potentially be a love interest for any of our lead characters. Um, and I know a lot of showrunners who don't believe in chemistry reads, but I'm a big believer that if you don't try it out in a small room with really bad lighting mm -hmm. and you know, sitting up close and seeing if you You're can see it. The drama now. Yeah, just the like actual. the the just the connection, like you know, that uh, <laughs> you, you, you kids go into that room like that show. Oh, this sounds horrible. Okay, I would like to make clear. Lots of other people were there. It wasn't just me. Everyone's um, dressed. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, but but I it's just it is a weird 
thing about our business where some people click and you want to watch it and you're like that people are going to believe that and other people it's just like ooh no two beautiful people but that's not working mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. have you have any of you been in situations and you do not need to name them but you are welcome to uh, <laughs> where that has happened where you've basically sort of invested in actors who have not had that and you're sort of like well now I either I have to fix this problem that we've created through the casting of these roles yes <laughs> yes I don't know if it's been so much I don't know. I, the situation I think of isn't necessarily like, they were both so great, but just didn't have chemistry. It was like, one just wasn't that great. So I don't yeah. know what chemistry he might have had with anybody. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's hard, you know? It's not good. I mean, is that just a situation where you're like, and he fell off a cliff? <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> how, I mean, how do you, how, how do you sort of I know, go about <laughs> rectifying? Well, I don't know. I, when I, the first pilot I ever did with, was a pilot called Split Decision, and Mark Perry came on as showrunner, and we would, like, sit watching dailies in Video Village, and he would be like, um, he would, he would say, there's a minivan in episode two. We never made it to episode two. He'd be like, there's a minivan. It's going off a cliff. <laughs> This person is in it. And then, and then the whole shoot, he would be like, the minivan is getting fuller. <laughs> I like that. I was like, maybe we need to be in the minivan. <laughs> I'm like, we did this. <laughs> um, I think... Uh Another really interesting thing that you get to do through writing for television when you write about love is you get to write love at all different ages. Mm -hmm. um, and I think almost all of you have written both sort of the discovery of love and also sort of older love. Uh, what do you enjoy about writing for each? I'll, I mean, I'll start Old with Old people sex. No. <laughs> <laughs> if it is, you can say it. This is a safe space. No, no. Um, <laughs> But yeah. be kind. Yeah, no, <laughs> I'm an old person. Um, I, I, I mean, look, there's something wonderful about, I think, writing for teenagers that, that we've kind of spoken about on various panels, which anytime you're writing for somebody experiencing a first, um, any kind of first, not even necessarily the obvious first, I think that there's something so exciting about that and so visceral, and it gives an opportunity for older people watching to kind of relive their firsts. Um, but there is something about writing about kind of more mature relationships too and I have to say you know right now on casual Michaela Watkins character is just turning 40 um, she you know is divorced a mother and kind of getting back out into the dating world now and it's really really fun to write and it might be because I'm 40 I'm a mom you know there are there are things that I certainly relate to about it um, but it is so much more or maybe not more but equally uncomfortable yeah. in the best way and when she has victories it feels so great and when it's awful it just feels so awful and um and it's 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 just as satisfying you know and sometimes even more because um i don't know maybe it's just it's it's my age you know yeah because you have three generations of women dating on your show we do i i like i like writing women in general and i like writing all different ages and uh, in in the f first season I talked to Yvonne who plays Alba and I we have so much story that we're getting through but we're coming to your love story don't worry we're coming um, and once uh, we did a part of it this year um, that that sort of reawakened her uh, in in the dating scene it was really it, she just talked to me about how it, how much it meant to her to see um, an older woman uh, not just there to, you know, help other people in their Facilitate lives. Facilitate the younger side. Exactly, and and uh, that it was really meaningful to her that she got, and uh, she had this one look on her face when she got this flower and she came into, she was telling her family she was um, gonna get married and like, he was bad luck, it didn't work out. But, um, <laughs> but uh, she just, she walked in and she had this look that like her eyes went up and she looked it the editors kept freezing and he kept saying look at that face look at that face and it was that same that feeling of of uh being in love and i loved watching her play and i loved watching her have this um relationship and even though it didn't work out realized that that is something that she wanted in her life um so it's something that we're going to continue to do and i feel like i'm um, i guess you know for the same reasons liz said that that you know i'm older and i it, relationships are interesting, not just at the beginning. They're, you know, they're interesting as you go through them, and you always have to recalibrate things. And, um, you know, and I like having these three generations to play 
uh, different versions of love through. For, Hart, for you, I mean, in that conversation, what did you find interesting about introducing sort of a baby into a relationship in such a formative stage? Uh, we got to skip um, uh, all the uh, lovey-dovey crap um, and go, they had a legitimate thing to tussle over. How are we, two people who um, uh, have, have had sex once and had a baby, how, what, are we, what does this mean to us and what does it mean to the child? Mm -hmm. um, so we had this, we, we got to make actually more romantic conflict between them because they were held together. Um, you know, their characters was she would be a fierce mother and he would be an absolutely uh, doting uh, father, and that it, it, that was fun for me. Cause, I mean, I, I've been I've been married for a long time, uh, uh, really like thirty years, and um, so that's interesting to me. And when I was in Canada, um, I came down uh, to the states from Canada in '98. By ten years before that, when I was writing in Canada, I wrote I'm gonna say fifty coming of age teenager stories, one ofs and episodes of things. I can no longer make a teenage boy's orgasm interesting. There was one day when I said, that's it. I actually got a, a, a Gemini for this, uh, a, a kid got kicked in the nuts and he had a um, wet dream the next night and thought that the girl who kicked him in the nuts had set off his puberty, which meant they were in love forever. I was getting this award for this and I went, that's it. <laughs> is it no more teenage uh, and then I, I came down here and one of the first things I got to write in America was Tyne Daly falling in love with oh Richard Crenna Amazing. like oh, whiplash um, and that was just um, I had to I had to jump forward um, for that one and I'd been jumping back um, and then and then um, it's been really fun knowing people in their teens and 20s I'm in my 50s their uh, stories of uh, sex and romance are radically different yeah. from mm -hmm. what I went through in the John Hughes mm -hmm. era of sex. Um, <laughs> and so it might get interesting again, although the sex itself probably won't be. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just going to say, I, I've been thinking about it more recently about um, male-female approaching romance because Every show I've worked on uh, has been really through a female perspective, um, except Greek. Greek was the only show that really had kind of a strong woohoo. And Greek was so fun to write because you got to tell romance through the eyes of male characters, and I think that's really rare. And I wish there was more of that. I mean, you look at the composition of this panel, of our audience, it's mostly female. And like, I think so often shows that have romance at its core are branded a woman show, you know, or, and, and I think that it's so much broader than that. And, I, and so I, I've really enjoyed the times where I've gotten to, yeah. I am a man, so it's nice to go <laughs> through that perspective. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious also, uh, speaking of Greek and faking it, were you writing about love and romance for younger characters? Have you ever been surprised at sort of what you can't do through a younger character that you feel like you might be able to do if a character was older? I think you can, you can, I, we would often take our own experiences and kind of time travel them back and say, what is the college version of this relationship issue? I think you can often take the DNA of a, an adult issue, and it usually makes the story even more resonant. You know, so that's often how we worked in writers in the writers' room. We'd talk not only about our college experience, but what's going on right now. What are you? What are the frustrations you're having with your spouse? And you know, I I find writers' rooms are often like giant therapy sessions with like <laughs> seven other people or ten other people. Well, again, you do not need to say what it is, but you are welcome to. I'm curious what you think are the mistakes other writers tend to make when they write love stories. Well, I, I didn't I didn't think about it much that until I saw a catastrophe and realized this was the first time I'd seen somebody really do a brilliant job at middle aged yeah. um, hooking up. One hundred percent. Like I just went, oh, and uh, I wasn't remembering back looking at that, and I wasn't wondering what it's going to be like to be mm -hmm. eighty and and <laughs> gulping back Cialis or something. <laughs> um, here were two people. Uh, the fact that that show treated. Middle-aged people, they, we see their bodies, we see yeah. their, their appetites are not much different from when you're t teenagers, but, you know, they're old. Um, and that, that has made me tough on a lot of uh, middle-aged 
um, uh, sex now. And then I think you can always tell, and apologies to anyone, I think you can often tell when writers are writing kids if they don't have any. Oh. Um, uh, and that, I, that sounds snottier than I mean, uh, but it's like you, sometimes kids are saying, gee, sis, let's go out and play in the back and I get that. They do not have children. <laughs> uh, sis is going to bite him. Sis. And, yeah. <laughs> sis. Um, I wandered slightly off topic there. Someone save me. <laughs> Are there any things that you guys have found sort of stick out in your mind as when you see it, you're just like, ugh, you, that's not what you're supposed to do. Well, you know, <laughs> you know what sticks out in my mind? I'm a, I'm a humongous, this is gonna sound weird, but I'm, I mean, this part's not gonna sound weird. I'm a humongous Homeland fan. I yeah. love Homeland and I loved season one. I obviously, like everybody, thought they should have killed Brody at the end of season one, um, but then he lingered around for season two. Okay, fine. But then he lingered around for season three, and then in season two and three, it became, and P.S., I love four and five. I think Homeland is back. But season two and three, it like became this weird love story between Carrie and Brody, and they were like, it was like all of a sudden they were like schmoopy soulmates, and I'm like, is this a joke? I'm like, I mean, she's gonna like blow him up or something, right? Like they're not actually, are we as an audience supposed to actually believe they feel this way? Like really? And I just felt so, um, almost not manipulated, but like I, I felt like this weird love story was kind of being forced down our throats just because you were excited about their relationship in season one, but it was never, a lo I don't know. So anyway. It wasn't earned. Yeah. It, no, it wasn't earned. It felt so false. Yeah. Um, and I mean, again, I think Homeland is brilliant and I, I think it was probably a product of just being in, I mean, I think like anything, you, these two characters had so much chemistry and you're so invested in them that it's like, it, it's like that investment somehow changed the tenor and tone of the show to suddenly make it seem like they were soulmates. And you're like, what are we watching? <laughs> like, I literally feel like some schmoopy, like, and I love Josh Radin, but I feel like some like great Josh Radin song is gonna come on and it's gonna be like, it's a brand new day. And I'm kind of like, what is this Carrie and Brody? Like, blow someone up now. <laughs> what if you needs to not walk out of here alive? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Or kill Dana. <laughs> All things that did happen. Um, Jenny? I just want you to be on every panel I'm on <laughs> yeah, for the right? rest of my life, right? I told her, should she not have I'm a podcast? I'm just going to come to your living room heart. <laughs> should, do it. I'll just the be biz with Liz. The biz with Liz. There you go. I'll be your first guest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think just, uh, I don't, you know, when they're, when, they're um, when someone's too villainous, to me, that that's always the worst thing or when you're like I don't know what this character would see in them mm -hmm. kind of those yeah. that's what sticks in in my crowd because I'm like it's just a reflection back on this person who I'm supposed to be following and you know and and so I just want to know what the redeeming thing is not like when when a character that you love is just like mooning after a douchebag it's I, you know, it's... It, mm -hmm. That's such a good title for uh, something. <laughs> <laughs> Mooney after douchebag. My hard hand. I mean, we all have, but like then at a certain point, you're, you I grow up. never, never. Moon. <laughs> <laughs> But like, you know, at a certain point, you don't, you stop. Yeah, you pull it together. So um, I think that that is always to me where I'm like, you don't want just the obstacle to just be so contrived. Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I agree. Great. <laughs> um, well, I would love to open it up to you guys for some questions. If yeah, we'll start right here. Yeah. No. Something that I often find frustrating as a viewer, um, particularly with love stories, is when something off screen happens that kind of like sh just totally shifts the, what you're able to do. And I just wanted to know a little bit from your perspective as writers, like how off screen stuff can sometimes get in the way of a story that you might want to tell and. Like what the oh, you mean like behind the scenes yes. drama? Yes. Yes. Like they're dating and they live together, but then they broke up. Or, or they refuse to be in a scene together. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Castle. What? <laughs> <laughs> or, any or any show. Life. Or any show at all. But it's an excellent question because, you know, a little bit like you were saying with Emily, where the, her pregnancy, which is so wonderful, sort of gave birth. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do it. I was like down the road and I couldn't walk it back. Um, but it, to a wonderful storyline for you, I, there also, the flip side is also true. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would say that, that often the, the, my experience has been actors who have the most chemistry don't always have the most chemistry off screen. And it is very, um, 
it is a very magical thing that you capture that uh, that you then have to kind of manage. And I think uh, it is for fans. I know the how how much they want to believe that the world that is created is the real world. And so you have to kind of hide it because you don't want to share that with people. You know, you don't want to burst that bubble for the viewer. So it's definitely, you know, I appreciate what Hart said on the fan. I'm like, you don't get to know everything. And that's just the way TV works so that you enjoy the TV show. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. But it's like, it's like the Twilight dilemma. Like, that's exactly what I think you're saying, too. It's like everybody yeah. thought they should be together because it's Bella and Edward. But really, it's just Kristen and... Rob, and there's a lot of right, right, right. And then, or it's like the moonlighting thing. Mm -hmm. like right, 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 like right. Perfect TV example of that mm -hmm. too. You yeah. Know, so. yeah, yeah. Shouldn't she have gone for the Wolf Boy? I'm a straight, I'm a straight guy, but I, he's go gay. For the wolf Boy. boy. <laughs> Again, I don't know why we have to pick. Like, we're again, we're really ignoring the idea of just like three people being in a happy relationship together. I'm just saying. I'm in one this weekend. It's amazing. I have a, th a third person with my husband and I everywhere. It's, I can sit out. They can go do things. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. There they are. <laughs> story that you're dead set on but then you notice a chemistry elsewhere oh. and how does that change your storytelling when like maybe the fans kind of want something oh, else to I, I, I have a I, I think I can talk straight out about this experience that we had on bones our um, intention was to have um, um, Angela, played by Michaela uh, Conlon, be a free spirit bisexual we gave her a, uh, a female partner and they didn't have any chemistry. Um, uh, no, but no one's a bad actor. They just didn't have like the the chemistry. And uh, and then, god damn it, on screen, Hodgins in Angela. If you know the show, T.J. Thine and Michaela. All of a sudden, in editing, you're going, motherfucker. <laughs> They've got a thing, and we we didn't we weren't going for that. We were not going for that, but they they did it, um, uh, and they had this great chemistry. So we steered into that chemistry. Now the a le completely legitimate complaint fans had was, oh, you ditched the bisexual um, uh, storyline in favor of the heterosexual storyline. Uh, and yes, we did, uh, but it, we were going with a, f uh, we were going with a force. The one that you would believe, though. The one you would believe, <laughs> and the one that has given us many, many episodes. Mm -hmm. And if it had gone the other way, we would have gone the other way. But still, people are angry at you, and they're not wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I, that's like an example of something you can talk about. It doesn't, it's not mean to anyone mm -hmm. to say, but that those issues come up between actors and who has what going on so many levels that it does steer the boat. On. And I, I would say like chemistry is gold. Like when you discover it from wherever it is, it's like, oh, because because if you're feeling it, you know, your fans are going to feel it. And, and so everybody's just like, row over there, row the boat over there. You know? Not quite with that gesture. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we're just going to get I together like every week and have a panel. <laughs> I just feel like we'll that's just the be sitting there. We'll just do it every week. <laughs> do we have another question? Uh, yeah, right there. Um, going off of the, the chemistry example where you thought you were going to go in one direction, or but you, the chemistry is that, you know, what happens when, can you think of like examples where you wanted to go in that direction or it looked like the characters could have gone in that direction, but the story prohibited it? Like, those two characters would never have gotten together in 1966 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I, I would do a thing where you, now you have the challenge as a writer. I think he's totally right. You do not miss, you do not let chemistry go by. You don't mm -hmm. let it, uh, oh well, that's too bad. Yeah. But then you, you could put people in scenes together and it doesn't always have to be romantic. Yeah. You know, you just find, you find the way to put them together so that you feel that energy and that uh, the back and forth, and but it doesn't necessarily have to 
women to love. You just want actors together who yeah. like you want to watch, and you know there's things happening between there's them. There's more than one. Also, it doesn't have to be sexual. Yeah. Actors have chemistry. David Boreanaz and John Francis Daly mm -hmm. had fantastic chemistry, so it was fun to put them mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you guys don't have to make it sexual because the fans will, even if you don't. <laughs> so you're covered. Totally. Like, I mean, the Michael Rogelio fan fiction alone, Jenny, I'm just saying. <laughs> We'll take care of it, don't you fret. <laughs> uh, it's, tr it's true that I was gonna say that you do have to, you, you have to do so little to get people invested. I mean, literally, it sometimes comes down to like a double cut of people looking at each other <laughs> with a song, and people are like, they're soulmates. <laughs> and you're like, no, they're not. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah, it's just, yeah. it takes so little because I feel like people are watching and like longing for that thing. So it's like you really don't have to do a lot yeah. um, at all. Absolutely. Uh, yes, right there. Uh, romance is like so often seen as like girly or frivolous, and Jane the Virgin especially has really, especially at the end of the season, pushed back on that with the introduction of Professor Donaldson and um, the whole Bechdel Pass storyline. Did you feel like you had to speak out to it directly, or? Yeah, it's a, it's, uh, you know, it, well, I mean, it, it's a, such a big conversation, but because, uh, romance is something that's appreciated most, mostly by women, or seems to be. Um, you know, it gets put into this thing called guilty pleasure, um, which is uh, problematic, right? I hate um, the guilty pleasure. And then, and then, so you're already judging. Why do you have to it. feel guilty about it? Why do you have to? There's no. It's just pleasure. So why? Um, and so it already, it's already sort of seen as less than something that has all these signifiers of importance and meaning and dark and it's brooding. Um, and I. I don't believe that, um, and so we wanted to put that conversation into the show, and how could we put it into the show, but having somebody voice it and, and talk about it and um, argue against it, and then hopefully that the show, you know, it's our show does exist on this meta level, it's hopefully the show itself is, is you know, arguing against that, but I think whenever you're arguing against something, you want to show uh, what you are arguing against, so we wanted to articulate that. Thank you. Yes, in the back. Um, that's a sophisticated question, I think, I hope. <laughs> um, we, what we decided to do was make uh, Angela and Hodgins um, a mighty relationship. Uh, because we were going to do, uh, we kind of touched on this earlier, um, uh, Booth and Brennan, not going to break up. Not going to happen. Love, love story of the century. So there's a surrogate couple that, we, that goes through more peaks and valleys. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, there's several examples of what they go through. They, if, if someone's going to break up, it'd be Hodgins and Angela. We think they'd get back together again. And, but uh, it's a parallel track that is more fraught than our, the romance in our main track. We can only do that because we're a, a procedural. Um, you, I don't think you could have the peaks and valleys right. be your main um, uh, uh, relationship uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a romantic comedy or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Yes, right here. Can you explain who actually decides what the track of the story is going to be between you know the writers and the showrunner and the network and the you know the person that originated the story? Like, who decides what really is going to happen in a story? Well, I mean, I think. You know, either it's the creator of the show or some creators of the show have showrunners kind of put on with them so they're collaborating. But I think that, um, I mean, look, there are two answers. If, if, if it's your show or you're the person supervising someone, you decide. Um, but then, after you decide, a lot of other people decide with you. Um, and a lot of people question your decision. Either validate your decision or question your decision or, or poke and prod your decision to make sure that's really your decision. Um, and then you sit alone and think, is that really my decision? And then you convince yourself that it is your decision. Um, but I think it's, bo it's both in some ways. I mean, you're the person who is, who is the driving force, but I guess to be the driving force, you're gonna have to drive through a lot of things to get to the other side, and all those things are most likely going to make, are going to only strengthen what you wanna do. Um, 
you know, it can be a good stopgap too. I mean, I've, I've had some really bad ideas that thank God there have been some people being like, you need to slow your roll there. Um, so, you know. You must have a team that help you, let you have bad ideas so that you can. Yes, uh, 100%. So that you're not the, always the person uh, pulling back on yourself. Yes, totally. And oftentimes, you know, when you're on staff in a room, um, you might be having the bad idea that you get to pitch to the person who created the show or the showrunner. I mean, I remember on What About Brian, you know, Josh Reams came in, left us alone in the room. He was running the show for like... Um, a couple hours, and we came back and we were like, we have a great story. We're like, there's a cow on the lawn on June Street in LA, and there's just like this, and, and then we were like, and then there's an airstream, and he's like, I don't know what you guys have been doing, but there's no cow. And we were like, yeah, and someone's gonna go like, a cow on the lawn on June Street? That's not possible, and he's like, you're high, no one's doing that, you need to all go home. And we were like, I still am like, I think that cow story, was, anyway, we did have cows on casual, I'm like, that cow will come back someday. I'm like, that was worth it. Um, but you know, you, you know, when you're a writer on staff, it's, it's your job to pitch all those things. And when it's your show, it's, it's your job to hone those pitches and, and, and decide what gets through. And, and the great thing about television, even if it's one person who gets that stamp of it's, it's their show, it becomes all of our shows. It becomes their show, the staff show, the crew's show, the studio show, the network show, and eventually it becomes your show. Um, and that's yeah, and, and I would say being a... Thanks, you guys. <laughs> I would say being a showrunner is uh, this delicate dance of managing a group of artists and letting them do their art within the framework of your show while still having a vision for your show and, and charting it. And it's really hard at times because you can't make all the decisions. As a showrunner, we can't, but but we are the genesis of the idea and we're the, the vision of it. So it is this push and pull and there are a lot of voices in the room, but it really is you know, the showrunner whose job it is to, to set the path. So you know, the buck kind of stops yeah. with the showrunner. If you want to know who to blame, it's the showrunner. Right? Yes, that is who to blame. That is who to blame. And you can find all of them on Twitter after this panel <laughs> if you need to do that. Um, I think we have time for one more question before a final, yes. Jenny, um, how did you go about challenging the idea that a room, that a couple when they get together, well, sorry, nervous, <laughs> Michael, um, yep. a lot of people would see him as the safe, boring choice, but you actually made him the healthy, loving, mm -hmm. happy choice, and I wanted to know how you went about that because it resulted, I think, in something great. Oh, thank you. Well, it, you know, it was a conscious choice, and I felt like we set that uh, up in the beginning, we had a we put a lot of the weight on on Raphael, and then it, you know I came into the writers from the second year, and I said this is the year of Michael, um, and uh, you know I wanted her to make a choice because I didn't want to again reflecting back on her, I didn't want her to be somebody who could not make up her mind because you can only go so far down that road before you're like, geez, come on. Yeah. So um, so we wanted her to choose about halfway through Michael and. I, I think there's something very romantic about someone who knows you so well and who uh, safety it gets a bad rap, but there's something really nice about that and being known and knowing somebody. I mean, that is essentially a different kind of romance. It's just not the romance that is on the cover of a romance novel, you know, which is... So uh, we wanted to look at what uh, she saw in Raphael and then really sort of honor what she and Michael had and what their relationship could be and how fulfilling that could be. Um, and I think a lot of it, you know, technically came down to um, it, him not being jealous anymore, uh, him loving Mateo and her son as much as he did him embracing um, it, how much her family loved him. I mean, she's so close with her family and they all love him. You're like, gosh. There's like, you know, and, and something, there's something really magical in there. So we were trying to find the magic um, of, of what was seen as a safe choice. And then you shot him. We did. <laughs> what is the matter? No. Um, so, <laughs> you know I'm happy. No, I'm happy. You know how I feel, Jenny. We've talked about this. Um, I want to uh, close this out by asking each of you this question. Obviously, there's so much to be proud of in all of the shows you guys have created when it comes bigger than love, small in love, everything in there. But if we're thinking specifically of romance on your shows, 
what are you each most, what story are you most proud of? What, except, what do you feel like you've told that you're the most happy about? I mean, which love beat sort of resonates with you the most that you've put on screen? Carter, can I start with you? Oh, I, uh, you know, faking it was all around a, a best friendship where one person falls in love with her best friend. And so I'm just so proud that we got to tell that story and to, uh, that those, that their friendship survived that journey um, and and hearing from fans who connected with that has it, it will forever warm my heart I have so many years to choose from um, <laughs> that I know I'm gonna forget something but I was um, I was really pleased I, I wrote the, their vows uh, when they got married um, um, Karina Rosenthal wrote a ton of the uh, wedding episode but I, I wrote their vows because I'd been there from the beginning and 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 I was really pleased with how those came off. And then there we, we did a test run. Uh, we did an alternate re reality show, Booth. It, it, it sounds like it should be a telenovela when I say it. Booth got shot and, and he was in a coma. Um, and he lived in an alternate reality where the, the, the lab was a nightclub and they were a married couple. Um, and everybody else played, everybody else played radically different characters than they are in real life. But Booth and Brennan, the only difference was that they owned a nightclub together. And it was really fun to watch what they looked like as a couple that had been together for years, years before we put them together as a couple, to see if we could see what would happen if we eventually went there. And uh, that was just, I, I don't know if the audience would ever love it as much as we did, but we were all so pleased with them and us. And, and <laughs> the show. Plus Motley Crue played. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the moment uh, in Jane and Michael's wedding when, when he looks at, at uh, Abuela and, and she nods and you know he's been practicing his vows in Spanish and says them to Jane. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that, and uh, we, we had, um, uh, I think I was halfway through writing the finale, and, um, and uh, we were reading episode 21, so the one before, and uh, Carolina Rivera, who's one of our writers, came up to me, and she was like so excited she was going to burst, and she said, Michael has to say his vows to her in Spanish. Um, and it was just one, the minute she said it, I mean, I can only take credit for knowing it was a good idea. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I liked how it came out. Again, and then you shot him. I know. I know I'm just like, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> um, it's very hard to choose. I mean, my inclination is to pick something from Life Unexpected because that show is so, um, like, with me in my heart in so many ways, and there are so many little love moments. But what came, the first thing that came to mind actually is a scene from Casual. It's a storyline that we did in Casual in season one. In, um, an episode that was very much uh, ripped from the headlines of my real life, which was that when I was engaged to my wife, I one day we got in a fight, and she went to take the trash out, and I don't know why I did this, but I just locked the door the minute she walked out of the house. I just locked her out of the house, and then she heard the click and said, do you just fucking lock me out of the house? And then I was like, oh my god, the only thing worse than locking someone out of the house is now having to unlock the door to let them back in. And so when we were, when we were working on a casual episode, I said, what if Valerie just like locks Drew in a garage? And, um, and she did. I'd and locked, I'd locked Jamie in a garage. And <laughs> it happens. But it was, anyway, we talked about how long to leave him in there, and then once you've locked somebody in, when to let them out, and when you might need to feed them, and how long they'll be okay. Do you pretend it was an accident, and, they, and you walked away? And, and she, they had had an argument about lemons, because they were selling their house, and wanted to stage it, and so he, the guy, Drew, who's locked in the garage, is now just hurling lemons at the door, you know, and, and then they end up having this, like, sweet moment where they're both on either side of the door, and she's gotten him sugar fish, and she's, like, passing soy sauce under the door for him, and they're kind of dissecting how their marriage kind of went so wrong and, and how it's over and, and at the end of it, you know, you know, she unlocks the door and he realizes it and she's gone. And I just, for me, it was like, again, it was, it was just, I think because it was a personal story and I had just done it not that long ago and felt really bad about it and had brought it up in the room. Um, I think whenever you can kind of incorporate those real life things into like real emotion on the show and then getting to see it feels so, um, 
satisfying and truthful and obviously horribly specific. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. That's just what came to mind just now. I love it. Guys, this has been so much fun. I really appreciated all of your amazing questions. You guys have been incredible. Give it up for this panel, everybody. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Give it up for Jared. Thank you. I hope to see all of you again very soon and enjoy the rest of your festival.